Welcome to the afternoon session of our monthly meeting, friends. <clears throat> I get many emails from my friends about the masters they are following. My master, Azul Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh, passed away in 1948, so not physically here. Then lots of other masters are there. And many of these masters come from different lineages that they trace back. A professor in California once compiled a list as part of his PhD doctoral work saying the, that in the particular lineage, the Gandhi Nasheen, that means who are the successors and how successors are established. And he prepared a list of about 500 masters who all say we are in the lineage of great master who initiated me. That means today there are 500 masters who say that they are really coming in the line of the great master. So it looks like this, this particular stuff multiplies very quickly. And so they ask me questions about what their masters are saying. Particularly, they refer to some things that I share, which then goes on the YouTube and they can see it all over the world and what their master is saying and if there is a conflict they ask me please explain the conflict and I don't know how to explain the conflict because I have not I have not come to study conflicts or resolutions of what other people are saying I only know that I tried many things and eventually found that the system of going within your own self by a process by which we can concentrate your attention by repetition of certain words and by listening to the sound that is emanating from our own self and by doing the contemplation of the guy who loves you with these three things you can achieve the results that I'm talking of. I tried it and this worked, this system worked. Therefore, somebody asks me, does this Surta Shabda Yoga or the yoga of putting your attention on the sound within work? And I say yes, because I tried it, it works, it pulls you in. Does the system that requires only love and devotion for a master work? I say yes, it works. It did work. So I can only talk of what has worked for me. And so my sharing of information is based upon my experience, based on the teachings of great master Baba Sawan Singh. What other masters are teaching, even when they claim to be in the lineage of the same master, they seem to have modified some things. I can't comment upon those modifications and they want my comment. One master said, you should not contemplate in your meditation on the face or form of your master because that is being made up by your mind. You should wait for it. It's not part of the meditational practice. Meditation practices keep on repeating the words. If you can hear a sound, listen to a sound. That's it. And the man writes to me, tell what the master says specifically. You are saying, contemplate the face of the master and remember him as you saw him. I said, the teaching I got and the method I got involved three practices, three things to practice. One, repeating words so the mind cannot think. Words interrupt the mind's thinking that allows you to concentrate inside better. Second, to listen to the sound that also pulls you in and your attention in. Third, remembering the master develops your love and de devotion and you remember how you met and how you felt when you met. Then the third thing is a practice. Now if some master says, don't do it, I can't have any comment on that. Then you follow. Try it all the whole teachings of what the masters say. Don't mix up the teachings. I only share with you what were taught and worked for me the teachings of Great Master Baba Savan Singh. And I only share with you because they worked. 
and I only share with you that part of the teachings which worked for me and I do not go outside of it. I do not comment upon the competence or the status of what any master. I respect all of them. They are all trying to say, be good and go to God. Very good. I like that. But I cannot say how far they have gone, how far their uh, realization, what they will give you. I am nobody to comment upon that. Yet I get so many emails on that subject. So that is why I am clarifying that it is not my business to say, follow them, ask questions from them. If you see a conflict, ask the person where you see the conflict. I see no conflict in what I learned and the practice I had and the experience I had and it worked. So that is why I am saying all this that do not refer to me to interpret what some masters are saying which is at conflict with the great master's teachings. You can try it out. I tried a lot of things which were inconsistent with his teaching. I tried so many kinds of yogas. I tried so many kinds of suffering on the bodies just to help get to know something. It didn't work. And so many masters I met who could not even explain. Leave aside giving you experience, they could not even explain what the experience is. So that is why I went back eventually to great master and got what has satisfied me. I have been a happy person, which is also a good thing to be happy in this bad world, this silly world. Everybody says this is not our world. But if you are happy, even this world becomes your world. I can tell you that. This is a big difference. If you know the truth, you will be happy everywhere, including this world. You go and see a movie. You pay for it. You buy a ticket to see a movie. The movie has so many horrible things going on. You come out happy. You know, like the movie. How come the horror movies you come and enjoy? Horror movies are more popular than the common movies. And you say it's worthwhile going and paying for it and enjoying it. But you don't see this life as a movie. It is a movie. And when you can see it as a movie, you can only see it if you are seeing it not by this body. You are seeing it by sitting somewhere else and then watching the movie. You see the movie, you will also enjoy it. And you will see the ups and downs, the part of the plot of the movie. The difference between a movie you see in the theater and this movie is only one. The movie you see in a theater, you are sitting away from the screen and watching it on the screen. You are separated as an audience from the screen. In this movie, you have decided to be closer to the screen by getting into the head of one of the characters in the movie. That's the only difference. There's no difference in the movie, there's no difference in the plot or what is happening. It's just a show. But here, you are decided to sit in one of the characters. And because you are sitting in one of the characters to see the movie, you begin to think you are the character. Then, then it's not a movie anymore. Then it's reality. But if you can pick up yourself, where am I watching this movie from? I am sitting inside one character. People say, are we creating this universe? I say, what do you mean we? We, we means... I, so and so, you, so and so, are we creating universe? Of course not. You can't even create one little thing. How can you be creating the whole universe? But the one sitting inside is creating the universe and watching it. And if you can go to that position, depends on where you can go. If you can go only one step, it will still become a movie. You go to second step, you are the actor and the movie and director of the movie. Go one more script, you are the script writer. And everything on the movie, it's your movie. Imagine how happy you will be to see your script working so well. And we don't look at it like this. That's why the happiness does not come from events taking place here. Happiness comes from the awareness of who you are. And the more your awareness of who you really are, the more happy you will be. I'll try to answer a few questions I think Jonathan has in his hands. First question is from... Robert, age six, dear Ishwar, who was the first human? Were there humans when there were dinosaurs? 
it may surprise you to know that the first human being was a dinosaur human being does not mean the shape we have of the body today the difference between a human being and all other life forms is the human being thinks worries decides thing make choices experiences free will it does not mean that it has to have a particular form to do that human beings have been there right from the beginning of creation in different forms and the form they took was the form of living form at that time human beings were in the form of fish they were in the form of animals form of birds they were the same form as the species who came but they could think and decide what to do like we do the definition of a human being in the spiritual path is not the body form it's what how the mind operates in all other life forms it's like a drift along in, in instinct all other life forms function instinctively human beings function rationally and they think with their mind so this is very surprising in the hindu hindu texts they talk of avatar they talk of 10 avatars of vishnu they say there are three gods brahma the creator vishnu the sustainer and shiva the destroyer that all things are being managed by these three this whole creation actually these are just words that have been made into gods you could also say everything that we experience here has a beginning a middle and an end the beginning they call brahma middle they call vishnu and they call shiva and then they can worship if i say just will you worship beginning no will you worship brahma yes so it's a way of putting the context differently but they have said that all these three are there because there are three gods separated now into creation in hindu philosophy therefore there is a competition between them the competition runs like this brahma says if i don't create none of you exist sorry vishnu sorry shiva vishnu says once you have created your idol after that i take care of it you only one time job then you have to retire so i am the real one shiva says you have no certainty your life is uncertain brahma whether you will create or not vishnu whether you will sustain or not i am certain whatever you create i will destroy <laughs> i am a god of certainty so there are human beings in india some are worshiping brahma and they don't like to worship the others and there are some worshiping vishnu they say brahma is retired shiva will come to destroy right now the only real the real god that matters is vishnu the Sh- they call vaishnavites shaivites followers of shiva say no no we should only believe in what is certain they are uncertain gods so there is a division but the followers of vishnu they say when this world created by brahma goes into turmoil and sin increases and things go bad then vishnu appears as a being to take care of us and to resolve the problems he comes as an avatar they say he has come already nine times and tenth is still to come total will be 10 avatars of vishnu now if you look at the forms of the vishnu avatars you'll be surprised he comes as a fish comes as a turtle comes as a uh, boar an animal comes as a dwarf comes as a grown up guy with a beard comes as krishna comes as ram and is still to come as kalki now when you look at this this is vishnu coming why is he coming as a fish because there was nothing else in this ocean or on the planet except fish when he came in other forms that's when the land came up and these other things came up if you look at anthropology 
and link it with the vision with the avatars of vishnu they fit in so human being is not necessarily a form human being is that amongst the living forms there has always been one form that could think and have free will why did it happen why should any form have the free will reason is that the ability to get out of this mess can only come by seeking and seeking can only come with free will that is why this arrangement to get out of this play that's going on if it's too burdensome has always existed and existed through seeking and seeking is coming through free will so always one species has existed actually the question robert has asked me i myself asked great master i said great master you think they were also human dinosaurs he said yes same question and he said only one of them one species one form of them as it happens that form is the worst form tyrannosaurus <laughs> and he said they were like that but masters came in the same form too at that time so that is why human beings have always been here also let me also remind you from a different point of view that darwin came and he brought up the theory of evolution he said we have evolved we were monkey like before we became human and before the other animals and before that we were single cells to start with it's all evolved by mutation of our cells our dna is the mutation has caused us to become human today and darwin said i'll let you know the time table so drew up a time table by which we have come only very recently maybe uh, five, half a billion years ago maybe 1 million years ago called darwinian theory some say darwin was confining us to 50000 years that we were not in our homo sapiens did not exist darwin says that then there was there was a professor his name was professor leaky professor leaky worked in south africa on the fossils and he discovered human beings which were 1 million years old he discovered human beings their fossils remains of 2 million years old he died but his son and nephew and these those are still working in africa today you can read the whole story in national geographic and you will find they have found human beings with human forms 10 million years ago disproving all of darwin's time table and if they were really going to search in different forms in which they could think like this they will find human beings in some form have always existed from the formation of this particular inhabited universe yes what is destined comes easily and what is not takes so much struggle is that true <clears throat> what is destined comes easily and what is not takes too much struggle is that true destiny is true struggle is true struggle is part of destiny you can't separate the two when we struggle that's part of our destiny to struggle people sometimes say if everything is predetermined and you say is predetermined my destiny i'll be coming to this meeting i could break my destiny and not come how is it predetermined supposing destiny says i will fall from here i catch hold of this i know my destiny is to fall i'll not fall how is destiny predetermined these people have not read their chapters on their personal destiny they should go read it when they read their chapters they will find that their idea of saying if destiny says this we will not do it is part of the destiny it is there the man who says i am not going to do this if it is my destiny these very words are part of his destiny the very way he thinks is part of his destiny we think destiny or events outside and thinking is separate from it every thought of ours is part of our destiny you cannot possibly think outside of your destiny the predetermined nature of our experience here is 
that when you think I'm making a choice which looks like your free choice, is not free at all. Why does it look free? Because there are so many options available. You say, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. Okay, freely, with my own choice, I do this. You read the book, it says that that's exactly how you will think and make that choice. But it doesn't look like it here. Why? We haven't read our destiny. Now I keep on saying, read our destiny. Is it written somewhere? It is. Where is our destiny written? Can we go and read it? Sure. It's written insight on the mind. Our destiny is written on our mind, which is thinking. Just go to the pure mind. Don't, don't try to look, look at the mind which is working as a physical mind. Mind has a great beauty. It works differently depending upon where it's encased. That is why we call it Pindiman, that means physical mind. Andiman, the astral mind. Brahmandiman, the mind that is in the causal state. The mind can be studied at different places. It works differently. If you go to the astral and the causal, you will find destiny was written completely. Exactly how you will think, how you will choose, how you will seek, how you do things. Everything completely unchangeable is going through. The trauma has not changed at all. But since the nature of the destiny is that you can think and say, I want this choice and the choice is there. Therefore, you think you're making a choice without realizing that the very way you make a choice is part of the destiny. Struggle is also part of destiny and not making struggle, getting it easy is also part of destiny. What if you come uh, have an opportunity to do meditation and go and see your destiny? Then what will happen? Then can you change it? Of course you can change it. You picked up first time. Nobody imposed it on you. It was your choice. Why did you choose a destiny that makes you poor? Destiny that makes you sick? Destiny that makes you low amongst the others around you? Why did you pick up such a destiny? Well, it depends how much intelligence you use in picking it up. <laughs> Some picked up randomly, let's go and see, after it's just a show, <clears throat> which it was. We are taking it seriously, destiny became a real life? No. At that point, it's just a show. Which movie do you want to go to? <laughs> okay, we'll go to this movie. Doesn't matter. Have we picked up destiny like that? Some said, if we are going to sit in the character of a movie, we better choose a better one. So they made a little slightly better choice. But the best choice was made by those who said, if we sit in the head of one of the characters and the character can seek and find to get out, out of the movie itself into the higher realms, even higher than where we are making the destiny. Let's pick up that. And they made that very wise choice. I'm very happy to meet a large number of those choice makers right here today. <laughs> they made a good choice. Some said, no, 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 one life is not enough. We should have some more experience. And they said, okay, when we make choice of one life, we make choice of infinite lives automatically. Why? Because the very basis of creation of this physical universe as human beings or any beings is a law we call law of karma or law of action and reaction or law of what you have done in previous lives. Supposing there is no previous life, you can't be here. So have to, you have to have a previous life to be here. Otherwise, where does karma come from? So how do we come first time? We came first time with no previous life. How did we get our karma? So we had to make a notional first previous life. Not that we lived, but it's creating a life which we're picking up. We have, when we pick up a destiny, it must destiny of human life, it must have a previous life. So we picked up one life which we're living, one life we might have lived, and which created this life. We never lived it. We came for one life, but we created, and to create the previous life, we had to create a still previous, infinite previous lives to create one. If we create one, it must have ramifications in the future, infinite future lives. So it's not a question of picking up one life. We pick up one life, one real life, 
and we have infinite number of past lives and future lives which we bring at the same time. But supposing you want to stay for 10 lives to have a little more of the show. At that time, it looks like a nice movie. I'll be able to see several series. Series, one after the other. So you pick up 10 lives. The 10th life, you will have the seeking to go back. Not in this life. You have your choice. But you will still choose that better than those who come just for the movie and stay almost infinitely here for a long time. You still said, okay, after this life, I see I can go back. This is also destined. It's not a new thing that you become seekers and go back. That's also destined, part of destiny. Destiny includes everything. Congratulations on making good choice. <laughs> Are great sinners accepted into the arms of saints or Hari? Are great sinners accepted in the arms of saints or Hari? Saints come for sinners. If those are not sinners, what do they need saints for? If somebody is always doing good deeds and having good result, what does he need a saint for? Saints are for those who are suffering because of their sins. They cry out for God. They cry out for, for saints. So saints come for sinners. And I'm not suggesting go and sin. <laughs> I'm only saying that our destinies are such that when we are sinners and we are suffering, then only we call for saints and spirituality. <clears throat> if you look at the people who come to saints, I had a chance to see many of them. They come to great masters, come to other masters. I've seen they're all feeling sorry for their sins. They're feeling repenting for what happened to their karma, why they're in that bad state because of their sins that they committed and they want to get out. I have not seen those people who say, we are having a great time, we are very happy here. They don't need the saints. So, of course, saints are accepted in the arms. They accept in their arms the sinners. And saints don't come to look at sins. Saints do not look at good deeds and bad deeds. The good and bad is developed by our own mind. Our mind develops. In any form of life, in any human life, we develop what is good and what is bad depending upon the environment around us created, the society in which we are born, the religion we are born in. They all put the moral values on us. This is good, this is bad. And for all different people, they're different good and bad. At all different times, as for the same person, they're different good and bad. So good and bad is not universal at all. It's been changing all the time and changes from culture to culture. Saints do not come to look at good and bad. They look that this soul in this embodiment, in this form, has had enough, wants to go back home, they take back home. That's all. Saints come for the seekers ready to go back home, period. They don't look at the sins and the good deeds they've done. They don't go into good and bad at all. So, if they're good and bad, only were judged by the saints, I can tell you something. If saints were to judge us how good or bad you are and take the good ones here, we, none of us, have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> they don't look at it. The seeking that I am tired of this, I've had enough, is the requirement to go back to your true form. And saints come and pick you up on that. One more question. One more. There are thousands of thoughts crossing one's mind, but if all of them create karma, not just the actions, then mankind seems doomed. Can you please explain? <laughs> there are thousands of thoughts crossing one's mind, but if all of them create karma, not just the actions, then mankind seems doomed. Can you please explain? Nothing to explain, we are doomed. <laughs> what is there to explain? How are we doomed here? How are we here permanently locked up in this great prison of time? It's the very thing that you talked about. We are doomed. It's lucky that we can get out of it. It's lucky that a certain situation can come into our life 
that we can find a perfect living master who tells us we are doomed unless you can find something through your seeking. It's a, it's a, isn't that the situation? A, look at the whole world. Are we not doomed already? And what is the big trap that has doomed us? The big trap is exactly this trick to create space and time and put events in space and time and give the impression that we sitting here make our choice and by making a choice in our thoughts we create karma and we pay, for, pay back for the karma. Isn't that a big enough trap? Can anybody escape? You say thousands of thoughts, we create thousands of karma. You will know very well the implications of this if you just go within and study what is called sinchit karma. Very few people have studied that. People talk a lot about prolabd karma, that means the destiny we are born with. Some of them may say we are creating new karma, kareman karma. Nobody studies the reservoir of karma collected, which is so huge. Why is it so huge for each one of us? These thousands of thoughts. These are all accumulating. They can't be paid off in any one life. They keep on accumulating. And till those are settled, we can't get out of here. The karma theory is so strong that we are really the biggest prison, most cleverly designed prison. This prison of karma is the biggest prison. Somebody asked me a very good question. He said, you are saying that we, our intentions and our thoughts are creating karma. And that is why we suffer. I said, you also get rewards with good thoughts and good karma. You also get rewarded. It's a game of ga reward and punishment. It's not only punishment. It's a punishment reward. You love it. That's why you're playing it. He says, if that were so, that you are choosing good and bad and having karma, at the same time you are saying everything is predetermined. How can both go together? If it is already predetermined, then you can't create karma. It's already there. How come you are being punished or rewarded for something that's predetermined? And yet you feel that you are doing it. How are you responsible for an action or a thought which when you read was already predetermined before you were born here? The answer to that part is that you picked it up yourself. This DVD, this movie that you are seeing, you picked it up. So how, would you, how can anybody else be responsible? The fact that you are acting it now doesn't make a difference to who picked it up. You picked it up. Therefore, you are still responsible for this. But then the question is, if this actual picking up of free will is illusion, is not real, then how can there be real karma? The truth is, there is no real karma either. Karma is as much an illusion as the choice making. When you rise above illusion, when you discover what the truth is, not only your choice making becomes illusion, the karma becomes illusion. That is why when you discover who you really are, that you are an atma, a soul, you discover there was no karma. Karma was an illusion just created in the movie. There is actually really no karma. The soul of a human being has no karma ever. Never had, never will. It's the mind that is added on which holds the karma for the play. And once we are above the mind, there is no karma. It's a whole package. The package of thinking we have free will, package of thinking we create karma, and all this package, the whole law of karma itself is part of the package. When you rise above the package, everything is illusion. Thank you very much for joining me today and I'll see you next month again. Those of you who will be coming to the Bandara, which is coming up at the end of the month and on the 2nd of April is the big day. We call it a big day because, is, why, why are we calling it a big day? <laughs> a great master died. That's a strange to call a person's death as a big day and to celebrate it. It's very strange that a man dies and instead of grieving over it and 
saying, sorry, he is dead, we can't see him. We are celebrating it and calling it Bandhara, which means abundance. Abundance of what? Great Master Baba Savan Singh died, left his body on the 2nd of April, 1948. Since then, every year we have been celebrating his Bandhara. I celebrate the Bandhara for my experience. When he was alive, I had a very hard time to meet him. There were so many people trying to meet him. I had to go get my name registered for an appointment with him. And there was a lady there, very strong, well built. <laughs> she could frighten any man. And she was the one who had to let you go in. We, we couldn't always see him. After 2nd April, we could see him every day. We didn't realize it. And he said so. He says, if you are able to have the dhyan, the contemplation of your master during meditation while he is alive, and you talk to him in meditation while he is alive, that very form of his becomes the radiant form which stays with you forever. And while he is alive, you want to go see him physically. Because that's the physical reality you live in. When he's not physically there, then you want to remember him. And remembering is taking place inside. The radiant form appears and you are in contact with him all the time. That's why we celebrate. That he has not gone. People thought he had died, therefore he's gone. For those who we initiated and who had his radiant form, he never went. And he talks even more as more of a friend he plays around with us. He's a real friend. That you can't find a better friend like that. You can't find a better friend than a perfect living master who initiates you. I can tell you that. You can't find a better friend. And that's why we celebrate. He celebrated the Bandara of his master on 29th of December. On 29th of December was the anniversary of the death of his master, Baba Jamal Singh. That's the day he had a huge feast. He celebrated with everybody. Huge feast. That master still here. I can talk to him. And for a private conversation, you want to talk something private, he would have a little, small little hut. It was actually a, two huts in which his master lived. And around that he built his own house, in which he lived in that era. He would go into that one of those small closets, which was the original closet, and go there, sit there, and talk private things, a few private things. He was a good friend. You can talk private things to a friend. Twice it happened that he took me along. Two times. I can never forget that. I had never seen tears in his eyes, except on remembering his master once in that little closet. Big thing. The Badara is something that really brings us back into the reality of our relationship with our Master. And that is why, for me, the 2nd of April means a lot. And when you come and join me, it's a joining me in my celebration of that very great Master, the greatest. What he gave, never seen anywhere. So that is why I call him not only great Master, greatest Master. And on 2nd of April, I'll be meeting some of you who come there to see me. And as, as in every year, he'll be so visible that not only I'll see him, many of you will see him. That's great. That you'll be able to see somebody. And, and it'll, it's a great experience. And he will bless like nobody's got blessings before. I've seen that myself every year since 1948. So that is why the Bandara is coming up now very soon and some of you will come there. We are very happy to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.